uh, if I may uh, do that. So there are two things that I will focus on. One is uh, what we call collectives, cooperatives, FPOs, etc. So the government has a program for uh, making 10,000 FPOs. And there, while it's a very brilliant uh, idea, uh, nobody has uh, paid enough attention to how do we build those FPOs which will last the test of time. So I will give you two role models, which are going to be in the back of my mind when we talk about how do you build collectives. Because our hope is that if you like some of those ideas, we can work together and build such collectives elsewhere. So one is, of course, a famous Amul model. Uh, Amul is a 50,000 crore company. And uh, in terms of numbers, it's the world's largest cooperative in terms of numbers of people. No other place in the world has such a large set of numbers. So we were inspired by that even back then. And just as an illustration, uh, there is an NGO, not an NGO, a farmer's cooperative called Mulkanur near Warangal, which is a place in uh, Telangana now, uh, started by one unknown gentleman called Vishwanath Reddy, who was a farmer. And there was no NGO, no World Bank, no consultant, no government program, nothing. And it is running from 1955. And the founder died in 1986. So what is it that, so there are two questions. How do you build to scale, which the Amul story tells us. And the second question is, how do you make them long lasting? Amul, of course, is long lasting. But Mulkanur itself has been continuing since 1955. And it has grown 10 times the size when the founder died. So this is also a question, how do you build long-term sustaining uh, collectives, which will last the test of time and scale. The second thing, which I will try to focus on because we're in management school and which is people hesitate to discuss is the business aspect. Uh, because we saw some uh, elements there. Uh, so before I get into details, one thing I can say very, Clearly, right up front is both Amul and Mulkanur, and there are many other cooperatives which have lasted the test of time. Uh, they have succeeded because they have mastered the marketing and business, and they have continuously made profits. So what is our model? So in the development sector, uh, the idea of profits is always viewed very skeptically. If you are a socialist, well, I don't know what is this is some market driven thing. What is this? And if you're a capitalist, you say, can all these farmers, you know, they're all semi educated. Can they really run a business? No, no, no. We need smart guys with fancy degrees from places like I am only they can do business. So this kind of a thing, and it is not possible. And they always dismiss Amul as a exception, which somehow got. Uh, so I would like to focus on the principles that makes ordinary so-called ordinary people extraordinary and may you know actually makes sustainable uh, business model based on the experience that we have been working with on uh, 20 years so just just you think how do we build strong collectives and how do we build bottoms up uh, businesses which can last the test of time and uh, the last comment i'll make is collectives are a challenge i'm not trying to pretend that they are easy but we are all here because we like challenges uh, milk is easier to make into cooperatives for a variety of reasons uh, because milk is consumed daily, milk has no substitute known to mankind and everybody, every consumer buys milk but if you are saying, uh, you know, groundnuts or ragi or jawar, whole, people can lead their whole life without ever eating jawar and you are desperately trying to tell them it's good for health and all that and it grows once a year and you know all these challenges are there so therefore and there are price fluctuations and all sorts of things so in that challenge uh, how do we build a business model so these are the two questions so now we can uh, sort of start yeah so it's in the small and marginal uh, farmer context yeah so just i think all of us know this but we just thought we'll mention india has the largest number of farmers in the world even more than China. And the land holdings are among the smallest in the world. China and we are competing in terms of average land holding. And 70% of Indian agriculture is rain fed or non-irrigated. And the definition of irrigation is also very 
generous where if you have a bore well they'll say it is irrigated so it is not really that well irrigated and particularly in southern plateau uh, it is all rain fed and the government statistics say that 80 to 90 percent are small and marginal farmers that means they're all more or less in trouble so whenever you go out of IM, you take an auto or a cab if you are interested just talk to that guy 80 percent of the chances are that he is son or grandson or brother of a farmer and his parents are still living in the village and he is driving an Ola cab and he's better off. Then there are other chaps who are cleaning tables and all sorts of things. So there are basically a lot of people out there and therefore this is something worth doing. Yeah, so uh, one thing that we I thought we would uh, try to mention is where is the opportunity? So uh, Joe has helped us to make this. So what you see is that on the demand market side, farmers, this is a whole supply chain, you know, local farmer, middleman, local agent, district trader, regional wholesaler, national corporate. So this is not theoretical. Uh, our team is here, you know, five of them, please interact with them. Uh, they're all here from uh, Anantapur, except Kaushal, who is here from Bangalore. And we are working closely with IIT, IIT. So what we find is that when you go through the supply chain, uh, you know, you start from the village, then you say, well, what does the trader do? He gives it to the mill. Then you go to the miller. Then they, it comes to Hyderabad, Bangalore. Then there are corporates who buy it. And then they brand it. And then they sell it. Then they make value-added products, et cetera, et cetera. The share of the farmer in the value chain is very, very small. I think everybody knows this. This is not a news. The problem is how do we bridge that gap and how do we reach there? Yeah. Uh, the other thing is which all of you have talked about since yesterday is the low productivity. Now, the low productivity is uh, for a variety of reasons. One of the speakers, uh, I think in the morning, he also mentioned uh, the, the reasons are uh, there. Uh, so I will not repeat them, but I will only mention one thing that there is a good reason why the productivity is low. It is not only the technology and the agri practices that is required, and there's no doubt that we need to bring in, but there is another gap, which is the financing. So if you look at it from the one acre, two acre walas in these drought prone districts, uh, the he's always in loan. Yes, I know women do most of the work, but most of the loans are the head, on the head of the males of the, and the suicides, I've never heard a woman farmer committing suicide, I mean, we need to fly on both ways. We need to have both parties uh, on board here. So the uh, this kind of situation, we have to figure out a financial model for uh, making sure that they are ab actually able to implement some of those uh, agri practices. So the low productivity, I'm not getting into too much. Before I get into this, uh, because it's not there on the slides, I will just take two minutes to discuss about uh, our learnings uh, from how do we form uh, collectives, cooperatives, FPOs. So there are a few principles that I learned uh, about 25, 30 years ago from one of my gurus, whom I will name, called Shashiraj Gopalan, who un unfortunately passed away of cancer. So she taught me three principles of how to form co collectives. Instinctively, I liked them. I read some books, went and met Dr. Kurian, Tushar Shah, Many other people, Ram Reddy, saw functioning cooperatives, not so functioning cooperatives. And we said we will follow these three, four principles. So the first principle is uh, a cooperative is by the farmer, of the farmer, for the farmer. Uh, so Dr. Kurian used to say, for those who believe in cooperatives, uh, those who have faith, they believe in cooperatives. And those who do not have faith, you cannot convince them. So maybe some of you will not be convinced. What we found is, and in fact, this is this year's experience, that many of our farmers, tribal farmers and in uh, Anantapur and uh, Chittur and all, the local farmers, not all of them, but a few of them who emerge as leaders, they can do better business and marketing than the NGO, and they can do better business and marketing than many of the MBAs. So this is based on the faith that farmers can do it. Now you can say if they can do it, why are they not doing it? So of course you need an external uh, 
this thing and all. The second principle for the farmers by the farmers of the farmers is the traditional models say that uh, there will be a government scheme, there will be a subsidy, there will be an NGO, there will be a consultant, there will be experts in social mobilization, business, agriculture, and they will give training sessions and they will do all sorts of things to motivate and join them as collectives. We tried all that and we did not, it did not work. But it started working and I used to wonder why is it working. So again, Shashi told me that there should be something called member stake, which we also call skin in the game. So we went against the grain and said, Apna paisa dalo. put your money into it. So there were howls of protest and I'm sure there will be howls of protest here also. That how is it possible? They are so poor. How can they uh, uh, invest their money? And we were keen to work with as many of the poorest of poor as possible. I think we have partially succeeded in that. Not all our farmers are poor in the sense of below the poverty line, but in terms of percentages, as many are in our cooperatives who are very poor as in the general population. So how do we do that? So we figured out a model. I'll just take half a minute to tell you. When they give their produce, instead of giving them 2,000 rupees per bag, we give them 1,900 rupees. And say, 100 rupees of yours is deposited in your name in the cooperative. So that's how we mobilize that money. And over time, several crores have been uh, collected. So member stake is important for several reasons. That sense of ownership that it is mine and I have to take charge comes when they put their money where their mouth is. Uh, if you take an auto driver, if he's driving or a cab, driving the some other owners, he drives a cab in a certain way. But I can tell you, if you see somebody parked and he's cleaning the windows <laughs> and he's doing that, he owns that damn thing. Same thing happens in a cooperative when people own the cooperative because their money in it, is in it. Uh, they will be working in a uh, different way. We had challenges. Uh, there were protests from the farmers. There were protests meaning not dharna you know, saying nah, nah, this is not going to work we are very poor and they were also uh, pushed back from our own staff in those days no sir this is not going to work that government project is giving this subsidy this is giving that scheme that ngo is giving them this incentive and this is giving them uh, this and that but shashi had convinced me and dr kurian had convinced me that we should put skin in the game the third aspect of mobilization is uh, so this, uh, I mean, I'll say it in Hindi and uh, I will just translate into English. The best training program for farmers is putting their money. So I that when you put your money into it, when you put your money into it, your brain starts functioning beautifully. There is nothing like OPM. OPM is other people's money on which the startup sector is blossoming and 80%, 90% are failing according to my colleagues in IIM. It's not that kind of stuff. So I found that this is actually true. So for example, uh, when we started off on day zero, we went to a village called Bhimpur, which is a Gondi village uh, somewhere inside Adilabad. And we said that you give 100 rupees or we'll give you only 50 rupees. And there were howls of protest, but we insisted. So only 27 people joined. Now, when that day I spent three hours going to the Hanuman temple and hanging around with them, and while we were leaving, all the farmers came and said, Sir, soya bean ka rate barabar batate rahe. Please keep telling. They are tracking the rate of soya bean on a daily basis. Now, we make a big deal of modern this thing. There are local services available. In those days, newspaper, every day they used to give the rate of soya bean, cotton, etc. And there were some SMS services. They used to, uh, and they were tracking that money and they were figuring out whether to sell now or later. Of course, we held them to think through it. It's not that we did not. So when they store it properly, they ensure, they figure out on their own, rats, pests, dogs, cats, you know, the, should not damage how to store it, how to uh, keep sure that it doesn't get damp. All these things they figure out because unka paisa laga hua hai. It is nothing new. I mean, farmers are not, don't require uh, tremendous uh, external inputs on all these things. So that is one thing. So two principles. Number one is for the farmers, by the farmers, out the farmers. Number two is put their money where their mouth is. And of course, there is a fairly intensive uh, training and capacity building. It's not that 
we don't do that. But on what basis? Not on the basis of principles we teach in IIM Bangalore, but we learned it the hard way. So I personally went to local traders, dalals, people who are called khunchus, makichus in Hindi, bloodsuckers, sat with them like a student and wrote down how do you operate, went to the next level to the big wholesalers, sat down with them and wrote down what we did. I went and met retired wholesalers who were doing lots of money. I went to the millers and right there up to the mandi and we figured out naya paisa bhai naya, what are the costs. The business is business. There is a hamal cost, there is a cost of the bag, uh, there is a cost of, you know, after three months, the moisture content goes down, so the weight goes down, etc., etc. You do all the costing and then you say, well, where is the money? Because somebody is making money. That first slide you had put up, everybody, the, the food sector in, in India as we speak today is attracting tens of billions of dollars in investment. That means there is money there. So we are trying to understand the business from here and then move up. So once the from there we figured out where the money is, we started our operations. So I will just leave that business operations on B2B for the time being there and then we will go to the B2B linkages. So this is a, again a very nice uh, slide that Joe has created for us. So there are three levels. There is a village farmers, there is a village level cooperative and then there is a federation. So village level cooperative, we still call them cooperative is that uh, in a village there may be 30, 40, 50, 100 people who come together and it is voluntary and open it. We don't force them to come in with us. So when they do that, <coughs> uh, we went against some of the principles of Amul. I'll tell you what they are. And then federation is at a district level. So right now, over 20 years now, we're working with about 45,000 farmers. And uh, we just <laughs> did a analysis. In fact, Shankar is the head. He's sitting there. He uh, agreed to my request and they did some analysis that from the beginning till now, we have done about 182 crores of business yeah. only on groundnut. And last year, they did about 25 crores of business in groundnut. And if you add the government uh, schemes, so the government also gives them some work, it would more than double that amount because the government gives us 1% of the revenue. But if you add that as revenue and all the other things that you're saying, collectively buying inputs and saving 20%, etc., that of course automatically happens. They have their own shops. They have taken dealership from big companies and you know that is also happening. So then we had a basic problem. See, that's why I'm saying there's nothing wrong in making money if it is on behalf of the so-called poor. It's okay. I mean, because otherwise we'll have to keep running for subsidies. So uh, we said, let's connect to the corporates. And uh, we have a friend here. Uh, where is he? Uh, uh, yeah, he will also speak to us. Uh, he just retired three days ago. And he was heading a staple purchase for Reliance for whole of South India. And he was very helpful. So we started approaching Reliance, uh, Mayas, Flipkart. Flipkart also buys from us, more and Big Basket and all these big corporates. Now there is a barrier to crack there. Because, you know, you are talking about poor farmers and all kinds of agricultural practices and the corporates have certain quality, timeliness, all these requirements. So it took us some time to bridge that gap. So there is a rigorous process that they go through where they say that you prove to us that you are a reliable vendor. That means the quality will be good. If you say you will send one truckload on Monday, you will send one truckload on Monday, another on Wednesday, etc. You'll be reliable and then they'll put you in the list of registered vendors. So actually, Maruti is sitting here. Uh, he is handling our marketing single-handedly. And uh, if there are questions which I can't answer, he will be happy to answer. So he handles the marketing for us. So all the corporates uh, we have connected. And before I forget, I'll make an offer. If there are other FPOs who can match that, till they come up to speed, because they also have to go through his propers, we will help them to come up to that speed. But meanwhile, we can start selling it 
through our own registered vendors, Satya Sai and Prajah Mitra and all these people are already. So there is a demand, huge demand from these guys that why are you selling only groundnuts and tuar dal? Why can't you sell us wheat, rice, jawar, etc., etc.? So we can sit and work out the details. Uh, the only promise I make is that we will not charge anything except if there is out of pocket expenses, you know, transport, transport you have to pay. And uh, we will help you to come up to the requirements of these corporates so that you can also register yourself independently and move ahead. So this is uh, the B2B kind of thing. So that is what helped us to achieve market demand and scale. So I'll tell you something. There is a competition. When we think of competition, we think of big multinationals and big companies as our competitors. But when you are sitting on the ground, your immediate competitor is other businesses and traders and wholesalers, and you have to do better than them. Now, they are profitable, and you have to struggle to be profitable. Why is that so? Because the local buyers and local traders, they cheat the farmers, pay him less, and therefore the margins are already increased. If there is a miller, in Telugu we say, we have zero business chesta mandi. Zero business chesta means we do zero business, which means we don't pay any tax, we don't pay any electricity bill, we don't do anything. Whenever that chap comes, we give him 500 bucks and he goes. And when there's electricity thing, we have a system of taking it around the meter and with the consent of that chap. Now his electricity cost is less, his purchase cost is less, uh, and uh, he is not paying any taxes. Obviously, the name of the game is to sell at the lowest price possible. We cannot do that. We have to pay the farmer. We have to pay the electricity bills. It's a huge thing, you know, low margin business. So we have to figure out how to beat that guy and make money. So we started saying that we cannot depend on the local buyers. We have to go out. So initially, we started exporting to uh, Indonesia. We found a way of exporting it. We can discuss that later. We started find, finding buyers in Hyderabad, Bangalore. Uh, we used to sell to reputed people outside. And then we started linking with the uh, corporates. And uh, he, he will tell us a little bit more detail, uh, Mr. Ramchandra. Uh, they were happy to actually give us one or two rupees extra per kg. On a low margin, it's a very big thing. If you are making 2% and the price is 100, when you are getting 2 rupees more, your margin is actually uh, doubling. So corporates are also there to help us. So that's how we started thinking of it, that how can we be compliant with all the legal tax, electricity, et cetera, et cetera, requirements, safety, and still make profits. We have to do better marketing than the, what the local guys are. Now, the first barrier that we came up with is how do we finance these processing units? So right now we have, if we can count it as two units in Adilabad, uh, three in uh, Anantapur, and another three in Chittur, and actually we are setting up three or four more in Yavatmal. How do we finance them? Where does the money going to come from? Because we like to avoid as much red tape as possible because when we go, we don't want to take loans from banks. You know, We don't know what's going to happen. And most of the donor agencies are not willing to fund it. And there are government schemes and we have taken advantage of it. So where is the money going to come from? So this was one big challenge that we faced. So what we did is we started bootstrapping. It takes time and we will discuss offline if you are interested how we can speed up that process for the new. We don't have to wait for so much time. Uh, through just collecting the groundnut and doing nothing, cutting out the middleman and transporting it to the mills, which are 40, 50 kilometers away, they started making some money. And over time, we used to insist that some of the money they have to save. Not everything is distributed because they're anyway making more money, but some of it you have to save. So they had collected four or five lakh rupees and then they bought land. They bought 2.25 acres. I think these guys were also involved in that. And I did not get involved in the land deal because when they see somebody like me getting down from a car, the price of land from 1.25 lakhs will go up to 3 lakhs. They said, sir, Mir Raut and Mime Juskunta. You please don't come. I will, we will. So they negotiated and bought that land out of the retained profits. Then the mill cost some 50, 60 lakhs. There, I made a blunder, so it's not their fault. 
uh, that time the technology was such that uh, we thought of going for a big mill now technology on food processing around the country has really improved in the last 20 years so they have set up two small mills which is doing better business and better quality than the large mill that we set up but so we uh, somebody gave us a loan the farmers repaid it etc but in the new mills what we are doing is so i'll give you an example of how to finance this because after having done the marketing our friend nataraj is here he is managing in kalyandurgam the farmers in kalyandurgam which is very far away from the main mill some 60 km there they said we want to set up our own small mill because the transport is very far how do we do it and amir konjam sahayam cheyandi he said please sahay kariye thoda help kariye i said no no hum nahi karenge how much will it cost so in those days they said it will cost some 15 or 20 lakhs i said how many bags will you get so very proudly they said we'll get at least 15000 bags per year so i said 15 lakhs divided by 15000 what is the cost per bag so that much arithmetic everybody you know 100 rupees i said one time in your life you have to give 100 rupees and anybody here without a mobile phone so everybody kept quiet i said does it come for 100 rupees anybody bought this for 100 rupees and most of them are smartphones i said please give 100 rupees of your own money per bag once in your lifetime and a local guy donated one acre etc and that mill is up and running and it's actually doing more business than the main mill in guttur correct kalyandurga yeah. then third people started this year by the time the cost had gone up to 40 lakhs from 15 lakhs same model so so the power of collectivization if you do it properly and you get large enough numbers is sab log 100 rupees 50 rupees 1000 rupees de do so you you can do it so that is how we have been uh, financing this so this is the thing about uh, building that supply chain now here it gets little technical because it's a technical subject processing you have to learn what are the what is the best machinery available how, how do you maintain quality day after day after day and then how do you pack it properly clean it and uh, then only you can send it to the corporate so those systems have to be put in place i mean just to give an example i think we have following one thing very strictly even if the chief minister our minister come many ministers have come we tell them sir please remove your shoes and then enter the place because this is a food processing unit you are not allowed to wear shoes here and of course that applies to the workers managers who are working there things like that the women have to wear a uh, cap because of the way if the hair falls that's another problem so whatever uh, simple practices are there to maintain quality apart from the food and machinery we have to follow that and have now um, people like kaushal who's from iit kanpur and i don't know why the hell is working for us but we are grateful they are working with their friends to develop all this software and apps so that that information can be immediately captured so that we can you know do analysis or provide it to various people for how much farmer is giving how much and what is the cost what is the quality all those parameters we have to do and before i forget the quality i'll just mention another thing about so the quality has to be at the grassroots level so in amul for example when every farmer comes to pour milk whether it is 1 liter or 2 liters into the local village there is now a modern scientific instrumentation which tests that milk how much is protein how much is fat is there water added to it has he added calcium uh, oxide etc is it fresh or bad and if it is below a certain level it is rejected and then the price is fixed based on the quality this is so crucial because uh, if you pay the same price for good quality and bad quality everybody will mix water in milk or milk in water whichever way you want to call it and put it there and everybody will get a good price we made that mistake initially we were not strict about quality control and farmers of course they're all poor and all that but they will add bhusa they will add sand <laughs> some people were adding rocks at the bottom so first time when we did in chandra and palli we actually i mean i financed it personally because it was a, this thing we made a loss of some 30000 rupees and like, how the hell i have done all the calculation then we found this is the case then we put in the systems that quality check will happen at the village level and of course we discuss with the farmers so now it gives us a huge advantage in the market because when you start from there and go to either the local miller or to reliance uh, we've already 90% of the quality problem is already sorted out there so and the quality consciousness starts building in and they also understand it's not that they don't understand that if you don't uh, 
maintain quality, will not get the price. And if in one truckload there are three people assisting and one guy has cheated, then he will take out that bag and he will put the bad quality price on the entire truckload and everybody will lose. So the other day I had gone to Adilabad. There we have cotton farmers. They're also doing uh, outsourcing ginning and they did some 15 crores of business. So I was telling them quality. What is the responsibility of an ordinary farmer who is a member? So now all of us know, nobody talks about it, that farmers sprinkle water on the cotton. Why do they do that? Hmm. It is a bad thing to say about poor people, but they do that. Why do they do that? Wait, but now because they do that, that fellow will check it and he will reduce the price. And this game of spy versus spy, I cheat you, you cheat me, and this goes on and on. And this is a never ending cycle. So we told them that, look, don't do it. We will get you a better price. Because once you establish a reputation in the market that your quality is good, people are actually happy to pay a uh, premium, a little bit more than that, and the business becomes steady. And the last part on the business I'll make, which is a problem with the FPOs and the NGO mindset or the development sector mindset is, yes, we are farmer oriented and we need to be farmer oriented, but we are not customer oriented. What does that mean? So say Reliance. Reliance says we want supplies 12 months of the year. Groundnut crop comes twice a year. Then we say we are run out of stock. Now, he's a nice person. He may help us, but most of the buyers are not bothered because he's getting round the year supplies. So we now started, what we're doing is if we if we are run out of our own farmer stocks, we buy it locally, we buy it from outside, we buy it from Gujarat, we buy it from Telangana, and we make a small margin because the farmers have understood that regularly supplying to the uh, customers is as important as just getting rid of our stocks. So that mindset. Now, as a result of that, in Anandapur in February this year, uh, Flipkart gave us the Golden Supplier Award, right? Wow. Yeah, because they came and did some inspection. They said, now this farmer capability, I will tell you, because there is so much of skepticism. So Flipkart came and I was not there. These people were there. And they saw the setup and they said, oh, we never thought, you know, this FPO NGO model will work like that. Why are you giving us five crores? Why don't you give us 50 crores of business? The farmer said, we're very good. He said, okay, then get it for us. Uh, so, so, sir, we'll have to sign a contract and an agreement, a legal agreement. He says, why? So if we go and buy 50 crores and tomorrow you back off because you've only given us word of mouth, then we'll be in trouble. Of course, they never came back with the contract. Corporates are very good and we have respect them, but sometimes they are into branding and PR and they just want to put it up on their website that now we have done this, that. and this. If you add up all the numbers of the number of farmers impacted by all the corporates, Sometimes you wonder, are there so many farmers in India? <laughs> Everybody is impacting millions and billions of farmers. So the farmers say, Wo sab humko malum hai, but ye ki baat hai. you do this. So again and again, I've seen that they are very good because their money is at stake. And there are, there are many more examples of this. So the supply chain, delivering to corporate specs, uh, selling associated uh, inputs. <laughs> So there is always a market. So for example, you know, our thinking is uh, we squeeze the drop of blood out of every grain of Mungfali. So when you do Mungfali, there are three or four grades, good quality, medium quality, small quality, brokens. For each one of them is a market. The brokens and the small ones are actually sent out to local mills where they crush it. And even the husk, so we have to make money out of everything that is uh, available. So even in Tuar Dal, which we do in Adilabad, when you remove from Tuar to Tuar Dal, you get a husk. It goes for chicken feed and it, it, it has a value. So we have to extract value from, so that's what uh, we have put up there about selling. Ah, this is another thing, selling to cash and carry buyers. Uh, in spite of our best efforts, and we always, in every district, we have made one blunder. Every time we go to a new district, we make a blunder. That is, some guy come and says, market rate is 100, I'll give you 105. And I'm a very reliable chap. So and so is my uncle, I live here, etc. And you know, I, and they give him for 105 and he doesn't pay. So of course, this has happened in Anantapur, it has happened in Adilabad, it has happened in Chitur. And uh, I suppose it will happen in Yavatmal in spite of our best efforts, you know. 
खुद मरे बिना स्वर्ग नहीं मिलता है अनलेस यू डाई डोंट गो टू हेवन दैट एवरीबडी हैज टू डाई वंस टू लर्न दिस आई डोंट नो हाउ एल्स टू से दैट बट मे बी सम ऑफ यूर स्मार्टर सो वी से कैश एंड कैरी we make exception to people like reliance because it's a corporate it's a erp system they you know send uh, invoice we send the material it goes into the erp system and within 30 days we get the payment because even he cannot stop that payment but whereas these other buyers they may give 1 rupee more on his paisa leke jao so that is a cash and carry which is very very important and this is where we blunder because if you make loss on one load the whole thing goes into a loss because it's only a 2% 3% margin you know the good thing is that now we are less and less involved so in guttur uh, same problem you know the big mill we have facing uh, a bit of a labor issue nrega wage rates going up and you know labor is not like that during the season you need a huge amount of labor and then there is no work so i mean that's a normal thing i think in the good old days or bad old days the garib people were subsidizing us by working for that one month and earning something and rest of the time they are sitting idle and somehow surviving now they are saying oh no because they have got other options to work so they are no longer willing to subsidize the middle class life so what do you do so now they have got hold of this color sortex so you know at the last stage what happens is after all the processing what we do it is a technical term we use locally called hps hand picked seed so we even now we hire but there will be 100 150 women and they actually hand pick and remove uh, the black seeds and the bad ones and uh, that's how we are able to meet their quality standard and they earn what about 200 300 rupees per day but since there was a labor this thing now we got this color sortex machines which uh, electronically detects the um, color and separates it so that is also started happening and i was hesitant when we started off because in those days it used to cost 25 to 50 lakhs which was a lot of money and uh, you know of course being a bit of a socialist i said it generates employment and all that but now the costs have come down and the labor shortage has come in so we have to sort of move with the time so whatever technology is required uh, we have to do yeah so you can see a tip in the sales uh because of covid the way the sales have been going up yeah we are selling uh, seed seed means not in the shell but after removing it so the seed is the uh, major sale and then there are some input sales which is our seed for i mean uh, fertilizer pesticide there are crops and uh, these are our b2b relations and of late he will take that story forward i will just uh, close with one thing that actually mr babu joseph uh, of course i always get into arguments he is the first one who uh, sensitized me to the need for sustainable agriculture he was is- insisting back then he used to head access bank foundation and i was resisting no we are not going to do it but he kindly agreed to fund us even but now we have got into something like sustainable agriculture on sustainable agriculture because we are farmer focused rather than environment focused only we found three principles to scale up one is the cost must come down when you do organic farming the cost definitely comes down number two equally important the yield must not come down the yield must go up not after 3 years or 5 years but immediately cost must come down yield must go up and the amount of work you have to do the shram is has to be the same as before so i have seen lot of dedicated people they make vermi compost they put cow urine they do this that and all and the farmer is supposed to do it on his farm what i found the farmers is they are watching the ipl matches till 10 o'clock in the night and some of them have a couple of drinks and nobody is going to get up at 5 in the morning and do all these things those days are gone there may be a few but aisa nahi hota so don't ask him to do detailed work daily to do this organic farming some dedicated people we can go on telling story so what we found through modern technology is that if you make vermi compost it has npk of 2 to 3% nitrogen phosphate potassium of 2 to 3% but that is not enough the bad chemical stuff has 30 to 40% now they have found that if you take phosphate rock phosphate which is organic and you do bio digestion which is through these rhizomes and microbes and you know we are doing that we can actually get a better yield since uh, our groundnuts are nitrogen fixing we don't worry about nitrogen but we do worry about potassium and um, phosphate 
So we are doing it through organic process. We have set up a unit and we are selling thousands and thousands of bags of this. It costs half the cost of fertilizer. The subsidized fertilizer, say we, it is half of that. The offtake hopefully is been improving, but we have not seen the dramatic growth. We did field testing and we found that the yield actually goes up by 10 to 20 percent. Yield actually goes up. So the farmers are convinced about it and there are people who are repeatedly buying it. There is a mindset that organic is bad. You know, all these chaps who live in IM Bangalore in AC, they all talk about organics. They're just preaching to us, show me how to do it and all that. And they are not interested in that. But here, when they see other farmers doing it and they see that the yield is going up, then it starts picking up. So that is where we are pushing on that. And uh, last but not the least, which Joe will take forward, we are, oh, MSP sales. Okay, so since government was there, let me uh, just mention two, three minutes on that. You see, uh, our experience, which is, of course, limited, uh, is that dealing with the government has many, many issues at the local level. There's no problem dealing with principal secretary, chief secretary, even uh, you know top bureaucrats. They're always very helpful. They even tell you, please have a cup of tea. We need more organizations like this. You're doing great work. And he'll call his secretaries and say, please help them and this and that. All that happens. But ground mein kuch nahi hota hai. Again and again, I've seen this. We have had problems where the government subsidies, I had to pull teeth for three years, including an officer who, who had five crores cash in his puja room, who was suspended for two days and maybe promoted after that. An IAS officer, educated IAS. So how do we deal with these characters? I don't know how to deal with them. Now what is happening is because the work has picked up, now Shankar is our manager there. How many times the collector has called you personally? How many ministers have visited you? So the government started, when the government comes to you, that means something good is happening. So one of the schemes, for example, is minimum support price. So when the minimum support price started coming, the government approached us, I mean, the Farmers Federation. And they said that, you know, take over some of the centers and you procure the uh, seed from uh, on behalf, the Federation will procure in, on behalf of the government. So I visited some of those places and I asked some farmers that, why are you coming here? What is the difference when the Federation is running this MSP center and last year when the government was running, what is the difference? He said, sir, when I come here, I am immediately attended to. If I land up at five in the night, five in the evening, I am not told to come tomorrow and I don't know how to come tomorrow because I have taken a tractor and come 40 kilometers. I have to sleep under the tree and wait for my line again tomorrow. But here, they will finish the work today. And everything is done smoothly and I get the payment, etc. Then there was a huge pushback and it keeps going back and forth because there are local vested interests uh, who are making a lot of money on this MSP because if you so, for example, they will get the collector to issue an order Ki MSP will stop in three days. Why? Because then a lot of stock will be left over. And it will not be at the MSP price, it will be at the lower price. We can buy it at a lower price or we have already bought it and we will divert it to Karnataka where there is no MSP. This kind of games we are very clever in doing all over the country and there is a whole hierarchy of people who are involved in this. There is, there is no money like government schemes and poverty schemes. Poverty scheme, how much money has been made, nobody has made a calculation, but the Indian ingenuity, they make a lot of money on that. So this is stopped when we do this MSP. Now, the other advantage to the Federation is, so for example, in 2017, we did 37 crores. And have you got that money? Yeah. So we got 37 lakhs, 1% for doing nothing, <laughs> just standing there receiving it because the government pays for everything. They give you the all that software systems which now are very famous and you press this button, that button, it goes and it verifies and all that and you get a receipt. All the wonderful things the government does, there is a go down, the labor is there, they are paid for the government. We have to just receive it and make sure that the records are kept correctly. That's all we do for that, we get 37 lakh. Then there is a seed, subsidy seed distribution. Subsidy seed distribution is an even bigger racket. So in Telugu, we say, Shankula Postinga ni Tirthanga, that means that water you have to put in the shank, then it becomes tirtham, means it becomes sacred. So that fellow has to certify that this is quality seed and that quality seed is bad. 
because they mix good quality seed with bad quality seed and divert the good quality seed in the open market and make money and give bad subsidy seed to the farm. This is happening all over the country. It's not nothing special. This is happening. So some senior officers said, why don't you distribute the MSP? So now the in some centers, we are distributing the subsidy seed. Farmers are thrilled because there is no mixture. The good quality seeds are coming to the farmers and good quality seed dramatically improves the yield. So this is a kind of a couple of examples of how we are working with the government on some of the uh, their schemes to implement is that through the power of, uh, there is one thing, you know, in every district of this country, there are schools with what we call midday meal schemes of various types. Uh, personally, ideologically, I'm very much in favor of midday meal scheme because I think we need to feed the kids, make them healthy. Now, there are complicated methods of doing it. Now, I'll give you an example in Anandapur, which we have failed. The, there was a collector who was a alumni and a student of one of my classes, he tried his best, but he could not succeed. They give something what in Telugu we call balamrutam, basically chikki. They take groundnuts, they roast it, put some uh, jaggery yeah. and distribute it to the kids because it is high protein and high energy. Now that contract has gone to some politician from the neighboring district. So you're saying give it to our pharma federation because we are growing groundnuts and we grow this thing, but we have not succeeded in that. The larger picture is that this kind of a scheme, whether it is rice, wheat, etc., our FPOs can, you have to patiently get after the government without confronting them too much. That ye midday scheme ka scheme jo hai, ye se se le lo, and we will enable that to happen. The uh, incomes will go up quite significantly if we can do that. So this is some some film that we wanted us to show. Sai Federation, Farmers Federation, General Manager. This is a lot of Pradana Panta Verisanaga. This Verisanaga, Manji quality, Undi, Nanya Tundi, Tinubana Rangaita, Manji Tarundi. Kanaka Mamul private Vapara Sulgunconi, Valveria Prantalo, Omukodum, Laval Garinchen, Valley Asanaro. Either Raitul Gui Sarayana Darale than JP, Dada by Samatra Mundu. Only grammar of Prairam or writer Sangal Airport is Kuni, Kavetumula Tombay, the Max Satanginda, Sangal Airport is Namo Avandar Valandar Mugals, pool and sail Patatulo, with the Laval Gadinji, Mime of Porta Stalamunukuni, Nabadwaru, CC Dwar Sakar of Topanta, Dabudis Kuni, Uga Prasing Unit, good airport, which is called the Rio. Dalar Chetalo, Chenica Nunchi, Chana Nastupotu, Atlante, Walaga, Yaparas Tulunchi, Dalarlo, Madevartaga Unde, Walla Chana Dinlo, Mosum Jestoundre, Atlante, Tukalona Mosum Jestoundre, Rate Loguda Mosum Jestoundre, Tipuri, Sakar Samasta, Mavanta Sangame Pandaga, Maki Rate Guda, Punjueco. Mamul character rate Itande, Chenke, Itan Chenke, Guda, Ikade Town. Chenke is not the Dabo Chedga. Apu, Nur Mutla Mandishnamo, Yawa Mutla Mandishnamo, Audira Mupe, Walpanta, but we don't pay the Ser, Avakro in Lakatalge, Pakana, Pulke, Libuedi, Purman Sontanga, Manasamstavalo, Chinabatunchi, Gil Manchi Rate Lipet Naru, Market Mosum Lake of Honda, Zaritan Taralu, Yedabu, Yapu, Ledu, Kotoko, Taraklasu, Pakutro, Kotoklasu, in private school of Golden Best Lone, Samusran, Garbavel, Dabu Betti, and Sadi Sunano, Paiko Konkuna, Sakam Prada, Sakar, Sangal Pradano, Jesmi Monte, Nerga, Utpata Darninji, Vinio Darni Jerite, Kutigala Mustuni, Malo. So I'll just say one thing. See, we started off with two questions. Uh, how do we collectivize? Uh, I don't think I've done a good job in explaining, but hopefully you got a feel for it. Uh, for the farmer, by the farmer, of the farmer. Stake. Farmer has to put stake. Our role as external facilitators is to understand the business right from here in the local level and put those systems in place, quality, logistics, etc., so that the farmer, then they can own it. It is like building a road in a jungle. You build a road. After that, the farmers will walk on it. There's no problem. But initially, someone has to do that. And uh, the last point I'll make is 
what is sustainable in from a human angle of course there is an ecological angle you see somebody said i mean i am very much for iit iit and water and we are working with them but every 10 years you have to renew it or every 5 years you may have to do desilting again because whatever we do but it's okay now right now people are in trouble we have to do it but amul is running for 75 years mulkanur is running for 65 years if we want to build long term sustainable organization which will last the test of time then we should think of strongly build cooperatives which will continue 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 so i asked them a simple question see governments have come and gone ngos have come and gone we may not be there but farmers will always always be there because human beings need food who is going to run this organization should be run by us or by you sir may may not uttam i said do you want it to continue till your lifetime or your son's lifetime or your grandson's lifetime no sir it should run forever that mindset we have to put into the farmers then they start taking more and more charge of it thank you thank you professor i just quickly just talk about this program and by the way the product team is here they are the ones supporting the scaling up so like you see in everywhere else this is happening here even chandrakanti showed us and similar numbers in groundnut which is the key crop you're seeing that 47% and interestingly again with some of the other things the interesting part here is if you'll remember the subsistence model which is the big issue here now it's an all profit model it's a model where whether it's a good year or a bad year a farmer will make profit from his groundnuts and i think that's the big shift here that they can now start to invest as well uh, this is again the story of india for groundnuts has been mapped and so again a story that can be taken to many other parts of, you know a large part of maharashtra gujarat so again a story that can move elsewhere we said groundnuts farmer gets 70 rupees when we do value addition uh, reliance pays 112 rupees but uh, peanut butter sells for for 500 rupees so we launched a brand called farm veda so i am hoping that we we'll, we are now selling a breakfast cereal for 600 rupees it is the high protein etc so we are into uh, building a brand like amul and we need your help and we are will be happy to work with you to take this to scale in your regions also because we have got a little bit of know how and uh, so you can take a look at it and our website is farmveda.in you can take a look at it but i'm going to start with uh, mr vimuli because this whole corporate connect is such a new thing for all of us and so tell us your experience as a corporate buyer one of the first buyers who kind of really helped support this model what worked what do you think could also continue to get better oh okay uh, thank you joe uh, thank you shastri ji and of course mayuri for this wonderful involvement uh, from uh, your side to me uh it was it was a uh, wonderful experience actually uh, i had i was working with reliance for the last 20 years and then before that i was another 16 years i was with some other companies and then some of the cooperative was also i worked i worked in gujarat cooperative oil seeds but that was the time we were buying oil and not the seeds at that time so uh, ever since my childhood i have been observing uh, whenever this commodity market is highly fluctuating and all of us know about that so i always uh, whenever I, when i started the, my career in the beginning in, in 1986 i was buying the sunflower oil and groundnut oil in gujarat and uh, to the last month to uh, groundnut seeds from ccd and from the traders so every time even uh, paddy rice uh, dry fruit spices these are all i was buying so whenever the market goes down or whenever the market goes up i have always seen the traders making money every year i see that i i generally meet them on the uh, during diwali because that's the time they make their accounts and all that so i keep me lara ji kaise is saal kaise hua ha re badhiya sir kal se uh, pichle saal se humne 1 crore plus kamaya hey, market 20 rupees niche aur abhi ek crore banaya ha sir humko thoda khap rata hai na so so when i started working with the ccd i mean when i was working with the uh, reliance and started buying ground net i was luckily chance run uh, this ccd thing then i immediately said this is the because i was earlier working with raichur uh, area and gangavati area and even in tamil nadu also these cooperatives but mostly um, were successful i was able to get the kind of quality product i was able to connect 
the stocks properly in time. I had a lot of difficulties, but though I tried my best to talk to them and then make sure that they are sustainable and then they support us because I'm I'm going I'm ready to pay to them to them because this this money I know that is going directly to the farmer. So, but uh, I could not succeed. Even we are still struggling there. So when I uh, started with CCD, uh, initially they had this problem of uh, connectivity. All the purchase orders and all that they generate uh, on an automotive system. Uh, we, in, in fact, we also don't know. The system calculates the what is the total uh, stock available in the store and what is the total stock available in our uh, warehouse on the night. And then it throws a PO to the vendor. So we, we maintain that code on that vendor code and they said this is the location, this is the vendor. So it, it immediately throws. So next day morning the PO is there in their uh, mailbox. Uh, actually they are not able to see the mails properly and then it is only five days late time. So they, they used to miss the purchase order supply. Even if you have seen, we have a uh, system of taking an appointment and then supplying in, uh, supplying on the appointment date. So initially they were struggling to do this and then I have seen as in total consignments failing. And uh, we, are, we all work in a GIT model. I mean, we just maintain three days stock in store and about seven days stock. Even one day, two days missing on the PO, we will stock out at the store and it becomes a nuisance. So three, four times I've explained to them and uh, some they were reluctant, but they were supplying because they were getting little more money and paying quantity. We are to the market, they are having their own problems in supplying to the markets. So they are relevant. And then the, the second problem I have with is the quality injection. Because apart from the physical parameters, we check the moisture level also. So three, four, two, three times, I mean, their moisture content was a little higher than it is required. And the vehicle got rejected. The vehicle comes to the and then goes back. It's, it costs them around 20,000 plus on a, a single load back to them. So first time, you know, they are taking it back and they are not me also. Then second time it got rejected, uh, there used to be a officer one decision taken at that time. Because he said, sir, uh, we are not able to supply to your relatives. We are sorry. Um, uh, your people are not uh, um, uh, taking it properly. And there is some miscommunication. There is some problem. Our moisture at uh, my location is 7%, whereas at your location it is 8% and things like that. Then I told him, okay, just hang on for a minute. So I spoke to my uh, collection center and I spoke to him, what is the issue? He said, sir, 0.5% is more. I said, we have two varieties. 60 count and 60, 70 count is the quality parameters, what Shatsi was telling. I got maybe five, six varieties. We take the one, first one and second one. So I said, okay, we take it in second one. Let's reduce to this and then take it. So I told him, take it under it because I know that is the actual process to them also. So when the the driver normal is disabled and touch the driver, then he called me. He said, sir, then he go to system and then the system sir buys a car. So it is not possible for cooperating to work like this. So we will take our vehicle back. It is a relax. We will allow this to get it done today. I will do this properly. And I will adjust the screw piece to you. Don't worry. You don't lose the screw piece. OK. But he could not understand that. Then kept on calling me every hour. I said, Sir, Kuch karo, kuch karo. So I said, I'm doing it. I don't mind. 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 Most of the traders take it back. So they don't argue with us. I don't mind. 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 So the question that you asked me is, it's actually a sea change from me. I have never expected a company to have so much like this because I had a bad experience with Raichu, Deputies, FPS, and Tamil, of course, never of the message. I have not spoken to the message, the message has not spoken to me. So I only left the message with Chandrasekhar, and this is what it is, please talk to me. I have a message from the message, sir, please go ahead and unload this talk. So this is, this is actually, then I said I should travel to Anandpur, I traveled to Anandpur, I met the farmers, I was going to put my phone, I'm going to give you weekly supply assurance for the three months. Please ensure that you supply good quality and I will from my side, I will ensure that your payment is safe and I will give you two rupees to five rupees more. Wherever it is possible, 
बिगिनिंग we have been supplying to him for the last 3 years and yeah, we yeah. don't this this is about 10 years old story i'm telling you please don't go away with the idea that we were all blundering all the time it was in the first few lots <laughs> after that for 10 years we have been supplying quite happily he is happy we are happy i was very good guy for five years and i i didn't think i would be yeah yeah i don't think that's and i i think the story and this is what you've offered the others this this step up is a big step up and you know CCD is saying that they have learnt it, helping others who haven't learnt it to understand what it is. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Any any thoughts on scaling up beyond where they are? Beyond CCD, beyond to UP. Beyond any Maharaj, thoughts on that Maharaj, as a bio? Yeah, yeah. I have bio. In fact, I have been uh, talking to Shastri in Maruti and all that also. Scaling up has been a lot of opportunities for uh, CCD. Um, fortunately, with this twenty years of experience behind the lens, most of the more retail buyers are not under me. Uh, including Flipkart, what has been installed in the suite, the Nord, the Bazaar, all of them have been built here, and the Metro also, recently the Concrete Metro also, you started selling the Metro also. But of course now Metro has come into Valence Gold, and going forward it's going to be Valence Gold, and Nord Metro. Uh, but yes, I can, I can talk to them. And then I've been talking to Shastriji and the Marathi and other people, and said, not only down at, let's do Uh, rice and paddy from Raichur. Let's do Tirgal from Madhya Pradesh. I have already done that actually. I have already done that. Then Tamil from Chittoor district, and I think we had something from the Vizag district side also. We had some spices as well. Uh, Prepared and all that. But one thing not very really high, but different really different businesses. Whether it's Tamil or uh, Tirgal or uh, this paddy or rice, I said I'm ready. We will support you. Please go ahead. That that's uh, that's uh, that's wonderful scaling up. Actually, I mean we can we can do that. Fantastic, fantastic. I'm going to go to Babu Joseph next, and uh, I'm going to merge your questions. But broadly, given what you've seen of CCD and your own experience in the social sector, and the conversations of the last few days, farming, water, integrated solutions in our market, your perspectives on some of this with your experience, uh, what would you like to add? As some commentary, some context, some opportunities. So I've known uh, CCD right from 2010 onwards, and what struck me was their focus on post harvest. So once you get the groundnut, what you do? They were great in aggregation. They were great in market linkages, value addition, and things like that. So I I was trying to push them to looking at productivity. How can you increase the productivity? For that, we will require water. So, how can we make water available to the farmers? So, it was really a pleasant sight for me to know uh, to hear that uh, uh, they are now into desilting of tanks, which makes more water available to them. So, uh, I focus most on the the production and increasing the productivity, because that ultimately results in increasing the farmer income. and there's so much of work happening the indian council of agriculture research of special sta- research station working on groundnut there are so many very good varieties available high yielding varieties uh, drought resistant varieties disease resistant varieties and my experience working with organizations there is lot of difference in productivity depending on the variety you choose 
So that itself, the right variety for the right geography helps in increasing productivity. So could we work closely with reputed institutions to identify the best varieties which are suitable for our farmers? That is number one. And there again, one of the biggest investments for farmers is the investment on seed. So since you have a cooperative, you have a federation, can you take the foundation seed and help in its multiplication? Then you can reduce the cost of seed production by almost 50% because this is something that we are supporting in one organization we are working. There are seed villages. The entire village is involved in the production of seed. They get the foundation seed and they multiply it. So that is an, uh, an opportunity that I see in CCD, identifying the right variety and multiplying this. And they can sell it at a little bit of a premium to the farmer. So it's a win-win for everybody. For the farmer, there's a reduction in the cost of the seed. And for the cooperative, they make that margin on the sale. That is number one. Uh, number two, I was so happy to go through the presentation of Pani Foundation where they discuss the package of practices so detailed. So that's so important. When to sow, what is the seed treatment to be given, and then the various biostimulants or whatever biopesticides when to apply even before the disease is visible. So if we have a process of educating our farmers on all the package of practices, because lots of work is happening on that in ICRISAT and all that, but it's all within the four walls of the research institutions. Can we, in CCD, through the cooperatives, share this information with our farmers? And when there is a problem, can they reach out to us and can we offer a solution? So all this will help in increasing productivity. And then soil testing. I don't know how much of soil testing is happening because, again, groundnut is a crop that is very, very sensitive to certain elements and they require certain elements. So there are now cheap methods of testing the soil and quick results come. And that could be, again, help in increasing productivity. And now with water coming in, see, a significant increase in yield will happen. And I, I know that now CCD is entering into vegetables and fruits also. So I would request them to urge farmers to set aside small pieces of their land for vegetable cultivation. It might be new to them, but what I have observed, it is vegetables and fruits that bring about significant increase in farmer income. So not only could they save the money that they spend on buying vegetables, which could be anything between 600 to 1000 rupees a month, and the excess could be sold. And the fruits also, it will give them continuous income after the third or fourth year. So these are some of the thoughts that I have for CCD. And uh, I request them to examine that. And uh, since uh, Professor Shastri is a big fan of uh, Dr. Kurian and uh, Amul, I'd like to tell him that in my uh, role in uh, Access Bank, I was heading the agribusiness division. And we used to finance the best breeds for farmers so that they can buy the best breeds and increase productivity. Fantastic. Thank you. So, Satya, uh, to you, the question is uh, the narrative hat that you'll have with, with what we are doing and all this specialization. For the two cases you've seen today, are there narratives that emerge from that? As you've seen some of the thoughts on yield and or cotton, ground nuts, you even heard one of the panelists talk about mint. Are there narratives that you have found appealing to yourself? Extremely appealing. In fact, uh, so much to learn from because actually that's the toughest part of the puzzle. Uh, because unless market outcomes match agronomic outcomes, uh, this movement is not going to go forward. So I think that this is uh, absolutely invaluable what uh, CCD has done, uh, what uh, Gujarat Amuja is doing with cotton farmers. I think there's a whole bunch of things to learn from. And in fact, I want to come to Anandpur as just Please a stop. student and study how we can, uh, you know, apply some of these things with our uh, farmer producer company. So thank you for doing this. I think it's really path breaking work. All right. Thank you. So yesterday we started talking about demand side. And I, as I, I want to understand the opinion here. Of what do we mean by demand side? We're talking about reduction of water. How much do we use, right? I want to understand, therefore, 
if we continue to grow the cotton and if we continue to grow the sugarcane, will the demand side actually come down? I would like to hear what Pani is looking at in terms of when they are having their collectives. How is that? Because you spoke of demand, but I didn't really hear yeah. the, the whole thoughts behind it. Yeah. How are you looking at demand uh, reduction right. uh, and demand optimization? Okay. Well, so thank you for bringing up the whole Amul cooperative and collective side of the story. The question is... There are already seeds and fertilizers cooperative large parts of the country and wherever you're working, I'm assuming they also exist. So what's the dynamics, right? I mean, they are pushing one thing, you could be asking for something else. Those are also collective of some form and manner. They may not be very functional. So I just want to understand that part uh, because when we say collectivize and we multiply these institutions, yesterday also that was my question, uh, there's a lot of confusion. Some group for doing water conservation, some group for no, making sure right. water supply. Thank you, sir. So, uh, my question is, uh, that was uh, uh, specific to Mr. Rajiv uh, I mean, uh, in fact, uh, you have done excellent uh, work in terms of scientific planning, especially for Manuka, because that was something that was missing. My specific question is, uh, you have done it for almost 10,000 gram jets as of now. Uh, so, uh, that, that must be covered uh, the over exploited of the political work. So, does that, if that has also resulted in certain improvements over exploited or, so for example, critical works? That is one. The second question is have you also been to this, the uh, aspects of drinking water sustainability efforts or taking up scientific life process for water conservation activities in the Thank you. Thank you. So can we can we have the so one is a demand side question. So can we have the demand side question answered? Yeah, I'd, I don't know whether we can answer it, but I can certainly share with you what our experience has been. So you your question was what do we mean by demand side management? And in that context, you were asking about so does that mean no cotton? Does that mean no sugar cane? I think the core of demand side management is the right crop selection. And right crop selection will have to be basis data on how much water there is available, which itself is fluctuates from year to year. So the heart of good demand management, I think the best case study we have is that of Hilary Bazaar. So for those of you who are in the Bengal district in Maharashtra, it falls in the shadow of India. It's a village with very poor amount of rainfall. And yet it's a village which even the most droughts, as it's very famous, which Pogotra uh, Bayar says, ki our challenge is you can come to the Hindu in the village, press it once, but once you have a pani, you can say, sorry, you can take it. It has managed to remain true to this promise. How have they managed to do that? They managed to do that essentially by convincing all the farmers that water is a common property resource. This is the central challenge, and this is something which sadly only Hebrew Bazaar, to the best of my knowledge, has been able to achieve. But I feel the fact that, that this exists proves that it is possible. And it has been our uh, endeavor or dream to get there. How we have tried is a very long story and with only partial success at the highest. But the essence of demand management would be number one, and continuous monitoring by the village of available water by having observation birds within each watershed of the village. This is the availability of water. The community has to collectively decide what crops to take and what crops will not be taken. The community has to collectively decide whether they can afford to have deep extraction of groundwater, which in many parts of Peninsula India is not possible. So you have to, for example, Hubre Bazaar, you cannot have big wells. So it's only the dug wells which are utilized because that deep water extraction essentially creates an inequitable competition for groundwater resources. And on that basis, so the one line answer is water is a common resource. It has to be managed by the consent of the Gram Sabha. 
this is the the high point that we must reach to and crop selection must be basis that Thank rest you. is a matter of lot of technical details which we take too much yes, time. but i think it's in the principle of the thing that yeah the essence yeah. comes yeah. down to it's the community's collective action around it that makes it happen uh we have the linking to that is the whole collectivization and is there too much do we need to organize between anybody from the panel wants to take that question on collectivization you'll have all done it in different ways whether it's for the market whether it's for rejuvenation of water bodies collectivization has unintended bad consequences well across collectivization oh that one huh okay one line answer in, in interest of time is uh, that's what i had said the, originally that a genuine cooperative is for the farmers or by the members for the members of the members these cooperatives that you mentioned they are the farmers have nothing to do with they have no member stakes they have no decision it is run in the name of cooperatives by the government uh, and uh, they are just cooperatives in name so there is no connection with that in villages we have primary agriculture cooperative societies called pacs it's the only cooperatives in the world which actually their main purpose is to give loans which have to be waived off later on the farmers have no role in either investing in it managing it nothing these are government run packs so just because something is called this is a very peculiar thing in india so since cooperative became a bad word we now call it fpo <laughs> <laughs> because cooperative is a bad word but in the rest of the world they still call it cooperatives we also still call it cooperatives but in the spirit of what is a genuine cooperative i hope that partially answers your question Thank you. But we can discuss it later. Rajiv, on the Manrega story and about the overexploited and are there metrics, etc. There. Yeah. So uh, definitely, when this uh, uh, selection of uh, gram panchayat happens, it happens on the aspirational district first of all. Government has defined what are the aspirational district, what are the most uh, overexploited gram panchayats, or in terms of groundwater or water scarcity, and then followed by the critical and semi-critical. So that is the priority we always take uh, to develop those. That's why this 10,000 GPs are ranging from the overexploited to semi-critical. So that is the one I hope your answer is got. Second question was you are related to, sorry, drinking. drinking water. So while calculating the water budget, you know, as I said that crops, uh, animal husbandry and then human drinking and human use purpose water is calculated. And then we have seen that impact on it is positive on the drinking water as well. When we take the landscape based mayors implemented all together in the Gram Panchayat. So the positive effect on the drinking water through hand pump is also there. So that has been reported. But since this is a, the plan which we develop, the, in Narega language, it is called as a prospective plan, which is a government is intended to uh, complete it in three to five years. So it's a short term to medium term plans. So the impact takes little three years, but last 10 years, the where we started pilot, I think a lot of positive stories are there. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Two to three questions do we have? So it's a um, question for uh, Chand Chandra Kanna. Uh, yeah, um, you mentioned like uh, it's a very good uh, practice uh, you supported for the cotton farmers along with the soil testing and uh, the co uh, organic carbon and other things you mentioned. So um, some data also you generated that is good. So after uh, using some um, organics, like how it is increased, whether it is uh, any data is developed. And other question is like uh, in cotton, there are varietal differences are also many, which uh, contributes a lot of to yield. And mostly it is BT cotton now. I hope that is a BT cotton. But uh, are there any special recommendations you generated through uh, this program? Uh, my question is related to processing. I think uh, each one of you spoke about for the processing of the produce. Uh, as uh, farmers get into the processing part of it, I'm assuming the risk involved changes from the production to the end use product. And how, how does that affect? And then what's been the experience of it? moving from a farmer who's just doing the farming to actually making produce uh, products which get sold to the customer what's the risk profile changing and how do you, what's been the experience on that how, what's what's the failure rate uh, is what i would like to know anything else from this section sir apart from the rates what are the other benefits farmers are getting from the cfp bulls chandakanji of the Thank you. So on soil testing and uh, the uh, the resultant uh, uh, matter, I think soil testing, if we look at at macro level, I think something which is 
yet to unfold. Uh, and I mentioned when I presented, I think soil testing is happening. Farmer are not really reading that report in terms of understanding, I would say, uh, uh, in the technical language. So what we have done is simplified it, presented into the uh, farmer group. And in general, in, in, a, in, a, in a village setup, whenever we do so, uh, testing a, for a sample of group of farmer, that uh, the observation are generalized. And based on that, the advances are formed, and which is correlated with the, uh, the uh, recommendation or the soil map of the district and block, which, which are available uh, uh, in that area, uh, uh, in the nearby uh, agriculture university or, uh, and their soil science department. So, so it's a work in progress. I would say it's not uh, always key. Uh, uh, soil testing is happening at a scale. It is. It's still at the lower scale, but we are making it used by the farmer and understand by the farmer, and then they uh, 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 do the resulting practices based on that soil testing report. In terms of practice, uh, the variety, I think all the uh, these are better cotton uh, uh, farmer is all, all of them are using bt variety i think 99 point something percent of farmer in india is now using bt cotton and uh, that is the case in chandrapur also so that is a natural course and in terms of variety i think most important recommendation which we take it from the nearby research station suppose it is in chandrapur central cotton research station is there and based in their research and recommendation we promote that variety and i think in uh, in terms of uh, uh, specific recommendation i think there are many recommendation about uh, uh, close spacing uh, uh, varieties and all that so that in 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 terms of area there will be more plant and there will be more production so all that kind of recommendation we are propagating through training uh, to the farmers thank you thank you chandrakanti we had the risk involved uh, professor you want to take that as you move up the value chain actually the real risk is the lack of ability of the promoter in doing business but actually the risk comes down because once you have a processing unit, you are insulated from the price uh, volatility and you have buyers like Mr. Ramchandra Vemuri and many others from the corporates, you are able to access uh, high value markets steadily. So the risk actually comes down. Now I have not done a statistical analysis of what percentage and all that you'll have to uh, sort of uh, figure out. Um, and I'll just uh, add one more thing. If when you go further into processing from first step to second step, uh, at the risk of doing some marketing, we've got a bunch of products uh, Hemant has brought this sitting outside. You can, but I'll mention one thing. So I'm going to give it to Satyajit. Uh, many of us who are health conscious, we eat muesli. So we've started making this. So this has got 33% protein. It is fully vegan. Now, how do we get 33% protein, which is tastes like Kellogg muesli or Swiss muesli. How do we do that? So simple is that we found that when you crush groundnut and make oil, the de-oiled cake is sold for 30 to 40 rupees to cattle. Then mix it with cattle feed. So I was always intrigued for many, many years. And I heard a stray remark from somebody that when you extract the oil, you can actually get it in a form which is fit for co uh, human consumption. So after a lot of search, I found some guys making that machine in Gujarat. We got it. And uh, they actually, the after the oil is extracted, it comes out in flakes. Then we got our friends and nutritionists and all, we tested it. When all the oil is taken out, this becomes a high protein muesli. So we have, of course, added all the things that we add, you know, some oats and raisins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it has uh, less than 0.1 percent cholesterol. It has uh, very little of LDL bad fat. Uh, it has 33 percent protein, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that 30 rupees of flakes which we sell now, this is being marketed along with uh, Kellogg. Uh, I mean, Kellogg is doing its own marketing at the same price, which is about one rupee per gram. That is 1000 rupees a kilo. So this costs 350 bucks because we are in the business of doing it. The point of making this is that in all the products that we are making everywhere in the country, there is a huge margin that we can make, whether you take rice, etc., wheat, from wheat, you can make pasta, you can make suji, you can make biscuits, you can make uh, high protein, fortified, atta, and so many things you can make. 
so everywhere we can do this and if you can do it properly and you know how to run the business the risk comes down the income goes up dramatically i also have one payment project in gujarat so the we are trying to export because we are a private partner is in a, a, a multinational company so the major problem peanut farming faces is the aflatoxin so i didn't heard anything about your initiatives on the maintaining the aflatoxin right. can you share something uh, i'll give a quick answer i found a guy called kunal kotecha in gujarat who is exporting groundnut and he's getting rid of aflatoxin but it's a long technical subject it may not be a wider interest so we'll discuss it uh, offline Um, very good question so for example uh, i am a strong believer in the power of collectives after critical mass so along with uh, price there are many things that happen for example our movement towards sustainable agriculture and organic farming has moved at a speed which is far greater than we would have been able to do so all the good things that we want you know soil rejuvenation uh, chemical effluents etc is going down and uh, the way we are able to implement the water projects uh, with uh, iit iit and kota condition paints and others who are very kindly supporting us we are able to do it much faster the second thing that happens is that because of the power of collectivization you know farmer debt so uh, as a professor i'll just take one minute if you are constantly in debt the solution is not to give more and more debt and more and more clever debts the solution is to make enough profits and save those profits so that the debt goes away so why are they less in debt because they are making more money so debt is a huge problem in rural india so debt levels have come down as one of the farmers said and there is a intangible thing which uh, you have to see it to believe it aap kabhi aake dekhiye the sense of pride and dignity that people have it has to be seen to be believed when i first went to mulkanur that was before we started i used to go to those villages and just talk to them so i used to ask them what is the benefit you are getting out of it they were not able to articulate it in a way we were discussing but there was such a sense of pride sir main bank lo sab bol sir i am a member of this cooperative for him that is enough like i am an indian i am proud of it that kind of a thing and it's real it's not it is development also includes making people happy and proud of themselves and giving them a sense of dignity it does happen i tell them in adilabad who is the biggest seth here they say jamal seth i said how much business is he doing something i said you guys are 12000 now you are the biggest seth in this place people clap they are so proud of that and you know we should not minimize this aspect of it everything is not about money ultimately you are making money to make happy and to feel uh, dignified so these are some of the non price benefits of collectivization thank you okay i'm going to now ask every panelist the one thing you all want to take away for the audience so i think we all know that there is a twin problem in the country right we have a huge water issue and we have a huge nutrition security issue Okay, right? and I think um, the solutions to both these problems are, I think, what has been discussed over here. And at least for the water issue, there are very simple solutions that exist that takes community into the heart of it, right? So instead of uh, looking at communities as a beneficiary to a solution, if you look at them as a participant to the solution process, then whether you're solving a water problem, whether you're solving an agri problem, I think it changes how you approach and changes how quickly you can, you know. Um, give that solution because in rejuvenation of water bodies we do it over 10 weeks it's impossible if the farmer doesn't participate right so how do you bring community back at the center uh, because sometimes what happens is we are so full of ourselves thinking we have the solution and we're going to go and teach you sometimes all it requires is a nudge and you leave it to them you know and so how do you do that and how do we put them as the problem solvers and all we are doing is a nudge i think becomes very important to solving rural water security problems in this country yeah uh so since water is the theme i think uh, community ownership of water bodies is very important the importance of water use as a group and there what we are practicing i mean in the organization i work with 50% of the members of the water use as a group are women and at least 25% are belonging to the scheduled caste and tribe so you find great empowerment happening 
they taking ownership and the, we talk of desilting and lots of tractors coming in and taking one woman perhaps illiterate perhaps from a backward community she controls the whole show and that is empowerment and uh, that can happen and for everything the community should take ownership if you want to bring in natural agriculture what are the alternatives and make them available uh, producing biostimulants is not easy so can you look at that as an enterprise so we use but somebody else produces that so water is a catalyst and it can bring about complete transformation in the villages but we have to decide on which are the various interventions it could be even goat rearing but if you decide to go for goat you have to have people who are trained to take care of the goats how is the goat cow shed to be prepared how is deworming being done how are the vaccinations and women can do that so keep water as a center a catalyst but a whole lot of activities around it and make the community ownership there and with women having a significant role to play yeah i will stick to ccd case a uh, couple of things i wanted to uh, inform and close the scalability is what we are uh, actually to work with uh, shastri ji is there are a couple of things which i wanted to share it is one is the customer base i told you apart from banking we have lots of modern retail uh, companies around which uh, shastri ji and definitely i am there with you to help and connect with all the modern details then of course the increase in product base which is the other than government and all that that's another thing and the value of these products is what the ccd has to do because ccd has traveled much uh, ahead in their uh, journey and it's time for them to sit back and then work on these things and it's been a better in oil and extraction all that in chicken and all that like definitely there are value added products and definitely ccd makes more money out of it we are taking shastri ji has already told when one year which gujarat is doing the soil extraction the ground part is kept as it is intact in the soil extraction through soil extraction the oil is taken out in the pod and this pod is used for the soil extraction for the snacks so it's a double it's for the supplier so he makes money on the oil he makes money on the pod again so that's not that we should see uh, we'll set it up separately i think we should be working on that also then export market i am on surveillance which is there is a huge market there and there are a lot of people making good decent money on export but export has its own uh, negative drawbacks uh, that has to be taken and then the last thing i will talk about is the cold storage as was mentioned in the speech But if the government comes, but the government starts to manage it, yeah, uh, to manage it, yeah, then of course it's managing. But we need to now invest money in cold storage because it's going to be next year itself. The ROI is going to be only four months, and is going to make is going to come out of that uh, uh, expenditure. I think we'll see the network on this. That's a huge. It's going to be a huge, huge success for CCD. I would like to see uh, next time I travel to Manipur, farmers should be driving in Mark and BMWs. <laughs> just to just to tell you a lighter side of it, two years back when I was doing management course, BMW has done a survey and they came out from uh, uh, their survey they found that there is one village in Andhra Pradesh having highest number of BMWs, and that's a place called Palakkad in a Gujarati district. What are the uh, income from there? Any any guesses from that? Maybe my English should be able to tell. No, it's lemon. Just the lemons. They are farming lemons and making money. They are lemon farmers. And highest number of lemon farmers in the world is a place called Palakkad in West Bengal district. All of you should see. I have to sit here. I think we heard some absolutely. I wasn't there yesterday, but I got the drift of what uh, happened yesterday and some of the work I'm familiar with. So I think there are great ideas, there's great work happening. But on a sobering note, I think let's be aware of the fact that the elephant in the room is climate change, and that's a countdown which is on for the you know for several years now, and now it is very very urgent. um without there's no time to go into the details of that but i think a lot of us would agree that we have no more than 5 to 6 years if uh any meaningful dent is to be made after which you're going to have 
positive feedback loops which set in which is going to make all the discussion that we've had in the last two days completely infructuous so uh, all i can say is that all this talent goodwill networks thoughts you have to give it an edge of urgency uh, and keep in mind that all this work water agriculture all of it needs to be focused on the central challenge of this epoch which is climate change fantastic in the face of that i have no uh, final <laughs> comments but i have some requests yes. one is one takeaway is that uh, there is a lot to learn and we would like to be connected with uh, all of you and learn more from you uh, the second takeaway is that i have uh, given him this uh, high protein muesli to take away so he's going to take it away <laughs> and uh, the third takeaway is that we have kept all our products outside uh, uh, wait for some time after everybody has seen it if you like you can take it away and uh, i would also like to work with as many he will also elaborate on that it is not about ccd my talk it is about the people of india the farmers of india so we would like to connect with all of you and work with you learn from you uh, and help you also wherever we can to uh, take our collective ideas forward and scale it up massively and of course i agree with all the statements that people like mr babu joseph and he has made on climate change and package of practices but i don't have to repeat that those are important so let us continue to stay connected and let us continue to work together so i also take this opportunity first of all thank all of you to giving this opportunity and my co panelists to learn from them as well and many case studies from especially from the corporate sector so i would uh, suggest uh, i will take the, this climate change as a subject you know to be dealt with with the immediate effect also this has been ignored actually but uh, yes regarding whether it's a climate change or say water uh, conservation or maybe sustainability the message from my side will be to have it scale of the landscape based until we don't have a landscape based interventions the impact will not be visible or not will be achievable so to have a landscape i think the to harness public schemes i am big favor because i work with government sometimes experiences might not be good but they are very few but my general experience from last 10 years working with government is very good only they need direction and they need also some kind of support which as a german development program we support them and then there are many other multilateral organizations and national organization which support government of india so i think the mission started by government uh, if we join them i think the impact will be very much visible and then the this landscape based can be visualized last but not least i think to mitigate uh the lot of focus has been in the sustainability approach is, is only climate adaptation now the shift has to be made to towards the climate mitigation change mitigation in agriculture as well we are talking to industry we are talking to automobiles to mitigate the carbon emissions but from agriculture carbon emissions has to be mitigated that is the key message and for that uh, the german and indian government has a joint venture project called uh, on the agroecology in slash we call natural farming so we have to start thinking the sustainability towards not only organic but towards the natural farming so this will cover all the problems of the water sustainability indian sustainability and then the climate change as well thank you very much thank you thank you i i think i will just add to that uh, with the the two two co panelists mentioned about climate i think that is the next level of discourse and learning how we can do from the In last today, I think it was a wonderful uh, learning from each other, and how we can continue to uh, to the next level. And in that series also, I think there is so much to learn uh, about. Especially, uh, we learn from the uh, Professor Sastri about what to not what not to do when you come to FPO. I think that is something which is very important. That it skill business is. most important part of the and uh, i keep discussing in my organization that as a as a as a non profit organization and the professional non profit there is an issue of understanding the business aspect and i think that is something which is the next level when we are connecting dot from production to the market and market connect i think this is something which collectively i think there are lots of experience to learn from each other and that is the way forward i would say thank you thank you 
So for me, uh, so for me this, uh, is this is the community. 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 You know, uh, community wow. knows everything. Yeah. All we do is put all it in a big, big picture, big put all the picture, blocks together, blocks and like together. Amrita said, nudge them. Nudge them towards it. Because they are the owners of everything that's happening. You know, they are the beneficiaries of everything that's happening. So they know what's best for them. It's just that how do you process it to reach an urban space, which is people like us, is something that they don't understand. And that's the only uh, connection that we need to make. But take all their ideas, put them together, put a process and ha- make it happen for them and make sure that they do it collectively is really the essence. For me, one of the big problems today is data. Data in our country is very bad. I, that, I think one of the reasons is assumptions are wrong. You know, so we never talk about assumptions that are written down for which data is being collected. And if data is wrong, then how do you, how do you, like like, like Professor Shastri said, with all the collective uh, NGOs and corporates and the number of farmers that we are working with, we have, we have, we'll have more farmers that we are uh, uh, working with than farmers really in the country. Yeah, so, so data is something that we need to have more conversations with and work on because nobody really works on it. Government data is skewed. Uh, data that they get from the ground is really not correct because assumptions are not correct. Uh, one state has some definitions, other states have some definitions, and, and and how do you collectively see a data from the country? Yeah, Professor Sasri, I just ordered everything online. Your muesli is out of stock, just for you to know. Okay, send me your address. Please send me your address, we'll ship it to you. Thank you. I've already ordered, I've already ordered. So when the muesli comes on, I'll order it. Thank you so much. Yeah. So a big round of applause for our cases, our panelists. Gentlemen, thank you.